Welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're very pleased today to have Dan Freed. Dan got his PhD with Isidore Singer and as a mathematician interested in physics, many of Izzy Singer's students followed that path. And Dan is going to tell us today about what is an anomaly. That's an unconventional view he has and we're very much interested to hear about it and to know it. So Dan, why don't you take the floor? <laughs> well, thank you, Arthur. Thank you for inviting me and thanks to everybody uh, for coming. Uh, you'll let me know at the end if this is an unconventional view. I'm not so sure uh, whether it's conventional or unconventional. But anyway, we'll start at what I think is the beginning. Um, as far as I know, are these papers of Adler and then Bell and Jacquif, which discovered um, an anomaly in spinner fields and fermionic fields through, um, as you see here, through diagrams in, in perturbation theory. So that was in the uh, late 60s, 69. And in the mid 70s and 80s, there started to be a connection uh, with, uh, with some mathematics, with the index theory in particular. So um, this is a scattering of papers and my referencing uh, and my history is not going to be very accurate, but um, you'll see some papers of uh, Nielsen, Schreier, Kujikawa, which I think are the first ones uh, in the physics literature to make the connection with the Atiyah Singer theorem. And then Atiyah and Singer themselves wrote uh, this very influential paper in 84, um, showing the relation to the index theory, pointing out in particular the, the determinant of the index theory as um, some kind of obstruction, asking about higher obstructions. There were papers about a Hamiltonian version of the anomaly um, and so on. So there was quite a bit of, of activity that started at that time. And um, these are two papers by Witten that were for me influential in my own thinking. Uh, this one, again, in the mid eighties about gravitational anomalies, uh, global anomalies, I should say. So anomalies beyond perturbation theory. And then this paper much later um, really is the one that started to uh, show that anomalies themselves obey some kind of locality, the, the same way that a quantum field theory behaves, lo uh, has locality. I think before this in the 70s and 80s, 60s, an anomaly was viewed as just a feature, a part of a theory and not its own separate entity. So, here are a couple of myths. There are more about anomalies that uh, I want to bring up. So maybe they're myths, maybe not. One is that anomalies are only caused by fermionic fields. <laughs> the other one, that anomalies are only associated to symmetries. And we can dispel them, I think, by thinking about some examples. So for example, if we think about the theory of QCD, uh, the flavor symmetry is anomalous. That is indeed an anomaly in a symmetry. And therefore the effective theory, which is a sigma model, pions also has an anomaly, but that theory does not have um, fermionic fields, bosonic theory. Uh, the theory of a free spinner field without any kind of extra symmetries uh, also has anomalies. So, those are examples to show you that the idea of an anomaly is more general. So anyway, after trying to set a little bit the stage, let me come to the main points that I'll flesh out in the talk. And I summarize it by this slogan, which is that quantum theory is projective and quantization is linear. And it's the tension between projective geometry and linear geometry, which is where the anomaly is. Or to say it better, more precisely, the uh, anomaly of a quantum theory is really an expression of the projective nature of quantum theory. It is the projectivity. It is some kind of measure of that or expression of that projectivity. And it's an old idea of at hoof that the anomaly is useful. As we'll see when, we, when you have projective 
representations, projective, whatever, the, pro the projectivity itself is a kind of abelian piece. And because it's abelian, it's much more accessible. And so that's a piece of a projective system that you can really get your hands on and which can tell you something about, um, about the, the rest of the system. So it is, as I say, a feature, something that you can use to study a quantum system. It becomes a bug, becomes an obstruction when you try to quantize. And that's, again, the tension between being projective and being linear. So it's in trying to linearize, which you need to do to quantize, where the anomaly plays its role, is the colloquial word uh, kind of suggests, its role as an obstruction. So here's the outline of the talk. So I'm going to start with talking about projective spaces removed from physics, just a very little bit generalities about projective spaces, about linearization and how symmetries in projective geometry look focusing on this projectivity, on this obstruction to linearization. Then I'll talk a little bit about quantum mechanics and what anomalies look like there. And then quantum field theory also and what anomalies look like there. So it's, it's a very conceptual kind of high level talk with uh, this part with no real examples, but uh, I just wanna set the framework to, to try to answer the question in the title, what is an anomaly? And we'll see the same diagram appearing uh, three times in each of these uh, three sections of the talk so that you can see uh, exactly what the anomaly is. In field theory, the anomaly is expressed in terms of a special type of theory, an invertible field theory. You can think of that, as I said, as an abelian or one dimensional kind of object, the one that's more accessible in field theory, those are the one dimensional or invertible representations. And I'll just say a word about the kind of mathematics that goes into it and that makes it so that we can do computations. And then I'll come back to the idea of an anomaly as an obstruction. So here we're just talking about an anomaly as a feature, something we can compute with about the projective nature. Here, I'll just briefly explain why it's an obstruction when we want to quantize and then uh, I think there will be time to give at least one example of this point of view, coming back to what was in those um, uh, initial papers and so on in the, in the 80s about the anomaly of a spinner field and just see what that looks like uh, from this point of view. OK, so let me start about just projective uh, representations and so on. So if W is a vector space, and in quantum mechanics, it's a vector space over the complex numbers, but what I'll say would work over any field, then um, we have two associated objects, which are both kind of projective. One is the projective space. So the points of the projective space are the lines inside the vector space. And those make up a nice, beautiful manifold with lots of symmetries. That's the projective space of the vector space. And we also have the algebra of endomorphisms of the vector space, just linear maps from the vector space to itself. And both of those are, don't change canonically if we change the vector space by tensoring with a one-dimensional vector space or a line. So if we tensor W by a line, then you see that there's a canonical identification of the projective space of the original W with the projective space of the W tensor K. And similarly, the endomorphisms, that algebra is also, um, is also unchanged by tensoring the vector space with the line. If we have a linear symmetry of W, of course, being linear, it maps lines to lines, and therefore it induces a symmetry of the projective space. If we just have a homothety, a scalar transformation that induces the identity map of the projective space. Conversely, a projective symmetry in that sense uh, lifts to a whole uh, line, except for zero, so what's a C star torsor of um, linear symmetries. So projective symmetries correspond to whole lines, except for the origin of symmetries of the projective space. So we express that by a group extension, a short exact sequence of Lie groups. I didn't put any dimension in uh, the general linear group and the projective general linear group, 
because we could think of these as happening in infinite dimensions as well with suitable topologies. And so the statement is that this map is surjective. Any linear transformation maps to a projective transformation. Any projective transformation lifts to a linear transformation unique up to uh, composing with a homothety with scalar multiplication. So supposing that we have some group of projective symmetries, what does that mean? It's a homomorphism from some Lie group into this projective linear group. Well, we can pull back this group extension and we get a, an extension, a central extension of this symmetry group G. So we get a new group G tilde, as well as a linear representation of G tilde. So projective representations of G correspond to linear representations of some covering group, in this case, a central extension, but in general, an extension of uh, the group G. Now we could ask whether the original group lifts to act linearly. Can we pick out of that C star torsor of uh, linear maps corresponding to each projective symmetry? Can we pick out one in such a way that it obeys the group law? So that would be a lift of this map to the general linear group. And that's equivalent to splitting this short exact sequence, uh, this group extension. In other words, to finding a homomorphism of groups here such that the composition in this direction is the identity map on G. So what is the obstruction to finding that splitting or finding that lifting? Well, as usual, we take this sequence and we extend it one further. We extend it by shifting the kernel, and we can do that because the kernel is abelian. And so what we get is some shifted version of C star, which we could think of as the classifying space of C star. And this uh, obstruction to being able to, to, to construct these uh, green arrows, this lifting or this splitting, is measured by this map. Okay. And you can think of this map as a homomorphism that you can think of this as some space of C star torsors, and we have a homomorphism from the group to C star torsors. And that's really equivalent to what this central extension is giving you. So again, um, this map, as I just said, is equivalent to giving this central extension. And that's the obstruction to um, splitting a projective representation with this particular projectivity. So notice in this diagram, we don't have any projective representation at the moment. There's nothing that this group is acting on. It's just an abstract discussion of the projectivity. But now if I'm given that to start, what is a projective action? Well, it's either a homomorphism like this that we started with before, but with this particular projectivity prescribed. And so we have to have that this diagram commutes or we have to tell how this diagram commutes. That's equivalent to telling that we have this central extension, which is equivalent to this map. And then we have a linear representation of this centrally extended group. And that linear representation has the property that the scalars, that the kernel acts by scalar multiplication. So a typical example, just to ground the discussion a little, is um, the Heisenberg representation, where G is a vector group. You can think of G as a group that uh, the Lie algebra just has maybe two generators, and we say that their commutator is, is not zero. And that's the canonical commutation relations that are exactly prescribing this central extension, which is the Heisenberg group. And then the usual form is that, uh, the Stone von Neumann theorem is that this Heisenberg group has a um, canonical representation where the scalars, uh, the kernel here, acts by scalar multiplication. And in fact, in quantum mechanics, that's typically how, um, yeah, how it goes. Well, okay. So in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, we're going to see both this way of representing uh, this representation, one as a linear representation of the central extension or as being a projective action directly. Okay. And in the quantum mechanics and quantum field theory context, then this alpha is what's called the anomaly. And if I split the anomaly, that's a linearization or a trivialization of the anomaly. 
if we're able to lift G to be linear symmetries. So we can go to a cohomological interpretation. So the anomaly itself is something geometric. It's an actual central extension or an actual co-cycle, an actual map. But it has an equivalence class. And the equivalence class then can be computed by more topological or cohomological methods. And so where is the equivalence class of this projectivity located? It's located in the second cohomology of the group. So it really depends what kind of group it is to know exactly what kind of cohomology we mean here. For a finite group, it's ordinary finite group cohomology. For Lie groups, we have to do something else, of course. And um, well, as I've said a few times now, this central extension is an expression of the co-cycle um, for that. And splittings of the central extension or trivializations of this co-cycle if I have two of them, we can take their ratio, so to speak. And what we get then is a homomorphism from the group here to the C star, which is a character of the group. So in other words, if we're given a splitting, we can modify the splitting by a character. And now the characters themselves have a cohomological interpretation. They sit in H1. So here we have H2 is the projectivity. Here, H1 are the characters. And notice that characters are the abelian or invertible version of what we started with. We started with thinking about representations of the group. And an invertible representation, it's invertible under tensor product. Invertible means it's one dimensional. Well, those are exactly the characters. So this picture is what we'll see in quantum mechanics and in quantum field theory that the projectivity or anomaly is one higher shifted than the invertible uh, kinds of representations. So that's the lesson from this discussion uh, divorced from mathematics. Now, one more topic is what do I mean by a projective space? How do I give a projective space without telling a linear space of which it's the projectivization? And I'll just briefly say that, that that's an old idea in geometry. Really, Felix Klein, his Erlangen program, that a geometry is given by its symmetries. And so we think of having a model geometry, which is given by, say, a manifold together with a Lie group of symmetries. And when I have the model geometry, so think here, for example, that X is the vector space CN, just some standard n-dimensional vector space, and H is the group of invertible n by n matrices. So that's the model of a vector space. And what's an abstract version of a vector space? Well, it's going to be a right torsor over that Lie group, which in that case are really the bases. And you can construct this abstract vector space this way. Now, of course, when it comes to vector spaces, we give a direct definition. But for projective spaces, there's really no direct definition that I know. Once we have this model geometry, we can think about this model geometry happening in families by specifying a principal bundle or having uh, something with symmetry, which is really the same as a family, except that the base of the family is now allowed to be a stack or a groupoid. So we can have self-symmetries. So for projective space, there are many choices for what model geometry you want, depending on what kind of symmetry group you want. So in holomorphic geometry, it's the kind of group I've been saying, all projective linear transformations. But we might want a metric geometry. And so that would be the Kähler metric, which is then the projective unitary group is what would act there. And in fact, we could enlarge the symmetry group a little bit and allow anti-holomorphic maps and in the metric case, anti-unitary maps, in which case we get the fubini studi geometry, meaning all um, is isometries of the fubini studi metric. So again, they're infinite dimensional analogs. Please. Okay, so that's the background. And now what about quantum mechanics? Well, so here's the usual presentation of quantum mechanics. It's a linear system, which means we start with a Hilbert space, finite dimensional or separable. We have the projective space comes in as the space of pure states. There are, of course, mixed states, and these are the um, extreme points of that convex set. Specify a Hamiltonian. And um, there's a function 
on the projective space cross itself, the probability function, given two lines in the, in the space, that you can compute the transition probability by that kind of formula, choosing unit vectors. And so processes in quantum mechanics, where we have an initial time, a final time, and a bunch of times where we have observables inserted, we can compute the kind of probability of that, and it's expressed in terms of this function. It's a number between zero and one, of course. We could also compute the amplitude if we're given, again, an initial state and a final state. Um, and if we're given vectors in those lines, then, of course, we get a complex number expressing that amplitude. But even already here, if these initial and final states are different, then this amplitude, uh, where we kind of get rid of the unit vector, see how it is as a function of unit vector, it already lives in an abstract line, a Hermitian line. So the norm square to the amplitude is the probability still makes sense, but the amplitude itself is already living in an abstract line. So I wanna say that really the quantum mechanical system is already projective. We only need a projective space, not a linear space. And if we're given a projective space, then, as I said before, we get an algebra canonically attached, and we still need to choose a Hamiltonian. We still get this function on the projective space. There's no problem with that. And we can still express this probability, and we can still express the amplitude, but the amplitude now lives, again, in a line. It's just a little bit more complicated to say exactly what that line is. But the point is that quantum mechanics doesn't rely on the vector space that we usually say, the state space, it only relies on giving a projective space. We can already tell the quantum system. So what kind of projective space is it? What is the structure group or the symmetry group in the sense of Klein? Well, the structure of the projective space is this function, this transition probability function. And now it's a very cute lemma, very well known, that if you compute the, um, the distance in this projective space in this fubini studi metric, so that's a Riemannian metric, a Kähler metric, in fact, but it gives a metric in the sense of metric spaces. It gives a distance function. And if we compute the distance between two points, between two pure states, then that is simply related to this probability function by that simple formula. And so what that means is that the symmetries of the projective space, just as a set that preserve this function, those are actually the isometries of the Fubini Studi metric. So there's a little jump there with a classical theorem of um, in Riemannian geometry that says that the isometries in the sense of a metric space are actually the isometries in the sense of Riemannian geometry. Um, blanking out uh, Steenrod and something. Anyway. So what does it look like in the simplest case when you have a two-state system, a qubit? Well, the projective space is the complex projective line, which is geometrically the two-sphere, the fubini studi metric. It's just the round two-sphere. And so we're talking about um, the isometries of the two-sphere. So there are the isometries that preserve the orientation. That's the rotations. Those lift to unitary maps. And then there are the ones that also reflect. So together they make this bigger group, the orthogonal group O3, and those lift to be either unitary or anti-unitary maps of the two-dimensional space. So we'll call the group Q, the group of unitaries together with anti-unitaries that has two components, and the group PQ, its projectivization where we quotient out by the central circle. It's not, however, central because the anti-unitaries um, complex conjugate. So the basic theorem in quantum mechanics, which is usually called Wigner's theorem, but actually something I read pointed me to a paper, I think in 1928 of von Neumann and Wigner, where this appears in a footnote, seems to be the original reference. And it says that the group of these projective symmetries sits exactly in this kind of uh, central extension. Sorry, it's not central, in this group extension, where Q is the group of unitaries and anti-unitaries and this is the quotient by the circle. And the, um, the import of the theorem is that this map is surjective, that any symmetry 
that preserves this function lifts to either unitary or anti-unitary. So it tells what the model geometry in the sense of Klein and Carton is for quantum mechanics. It's this projective group of projective unitaries, projective anti-unitaries acting on a model complex projective space. Okay. So if we have a family of quantum mechanical systems, then it's given, as I said, by a principal bundle with this structure group. And then we can associate to it this family of quantum systems, all the data we need, this family of projective spaces, this family of algebras, we can pick out a Hamiltonian and so on. And there's an obstruction then to linearizing, not having a family of projective spaces, but having a family of linear spaces which amounts to saying that we have to lift this structure group to this structure group, which is the one that acts on the linear space. And that obstruction is the anomaly in this family of quantum systems, or it could be a single quantum system with symmetry. And again, it's measured, it's equivalence class in some cohomology. Okay. And if we're able to trivialize the anomaly, if we're able to express this as a family of linear systems, then the linearizations are a sort of torsor. We can get from one linearization to the other by taking principal bundles for this uh, kernel group here. Okay, as I said, for a single group uh, where we have, sorry, a single system, but with symmetry, then it reduces to exactly the discussion that we had earlier about um, projective representations in lifting to a linear representation. So now I want to tell you how quantum field theory is really a parallel discussion to this quantum mechanics. And to do that, I have to view quantum field theory as being a representation of some kind. But it's not a representation of a group. It's a representation of something categorical, but which is not definitely a group. It's where there are things that are not invertible. And that's a point of view that was initiated, I think, by Graham Siegel, well, I know, by Graham Siegel in the mid 1980s, which is to say that quantum field theory, as a wick rotated system, it's important that it's wick rotated, is a representation of a Bordism category. So quantum field theory is a representation, but of a Bordism category. So, how does that work? Well, when I say Bordism category, we have to specify what type of Bordism category. And there are two parameters, so to speak, discrete choices we make to specify. One, uh, so they're called N and F. N is very simply the dimension of the theory. So it's the dimension of space-time. Again, it's the Wick rotated version. So it's not a space-time per se. And the F are uh, what are called the background fields. So in this formulation, there are no fluctuating fields. Those have been integrated out before we give this as a representation of a Bordism category. And what is a field? Well, best to look at these examples. A field is something that's local and defined on n-dimensional manifolds, and it's local. And it pulls back under um, local diffeomorphisms. So for example, Riemannian metrics, connections or gauge fields for a fixed uh, structure group. We could have real valued functions. We could have functions with values in submanifold. We could have more topological fields like orientations or spin structures. We could have B fields, higher versions of uh, abelian connections and so on. So there are many different kinds of fields that occur in quantum field theory. And so this F here, that uh, specifies the theory is some collection of these that tells you what kind of theory you have. And then the theory itself, well, we make a Bordism category where um, the objects are N minus one, that's the dimension of space. So the objects are space manifolds with this kind of structure. And the morphisms are uh, Bordisms like this. So the topology is allowed to change. Before in quantum mechanics, I had evolution along a line. So that's the case n equals one. The topology there didn't change, but in higher dimensions, we might have topology change. So this is a Bordism from the disjoint union of these three indicated by the red arrows going into nothing. 
And we're going to linearly represent this boredism category. So that means we're going to look at the category of vector spaces and linear maps. But again, we need an appropriate category of infinite dimensional topological vector spaces and linear maps. And then the theory itself is a representation, a linear representation, symmetric linoidal functor in the lingo. So to each space, we attach a vector space and to each bordism of spaces, we attach a linear map of these vector spaces. So notice this is a linear representation. It's not yet projective, which is what I said a quantum theory is. So this is these axioms are for a linear representation. So there are many variations of these axioms. One of the most important is to encode locality because that's one of the pillars of quantum field theory. And there are extensions of this and particularly in topological theories where, um, where, where we can make the, the theory fully local. Unitarity is not in these axioms. And that's important because in many mathematical applications of these axioms, the theories aren't unitary in the same way that not every representation of say a group like SL2R is unitary. So there's a theory of unitarizability and so on. And it's an additional kind of structure, which in this Wick rotated uh, world is a reflection structure and involves reflection positivity. So there's a paper of a year or two ago by Konsevich and Siegel that uh, elaborates on these axioms. And again, this is all in the non-topological case and um, makes some you know, progress towards a general theory in this framework. And I think there's a lot more to be done along those lines. But the theme of this talk is that quantum theory is projective. So how do we see the quantum field theory as a projective system? Because what I've shown you so far is a linear system. Well, that linear system takes values in some category of vector spaces and linear maps. And instead, we introduce a category of projective spaces and holomorphic projective maps between them. And in terms of the kinds of models I showed you, these are actually the full holomorphic. There's no unitary, there's no antilinear. This, this would be the full holomorphic ones. The antilinear ones come in in a different way. And as I said, the unitarity, the metric structure would also come in with additional data. So we should think of this as again, an extension, in this case, a central extension, uh, analogous to the ones that I showed you earlier for uh, quantum mechanics, where these are the projective symmetries, these are the linear symmetries and C star is the kernel. So this is a kind of categorified version of that, where if we have a projective space, we can express it as the projectivization of a linear space and we can express it that way up to tensoring linear space by a line. That's the first thing I said about projective spaces, about projectivizing a linear space. So if we tensor a vector space by a line, we don't change the underlying projective space. And again, we can measure this extension universally by going to some suspension of lines. And so that's what this is. I'll say more about that soon. And so what is a projective theory? Well, it's a representation of the Bordism category into this category of projective spaces. Rather than the usual Siegel axioms going into vector spaces, we should think of a theory as really going into projective spaces. Well, once we go into here, we can compose and we can measure then this anomaly, the subtraction to lifting it to a linear theory. And so again, I'll elaborate more about this anomaly. This tells us what an anomaly in quantum field theory is. And again, given this anomaly, we have an extension, a central extension, as uh, we did in the previous situation. Now it's not an extension of a group, but it's an extension of this whole Bordism category. So we get a new Bordism category, an action of it by lines, and the quotient is our original Bordism category. And again, a trivialization of the anomaly is, that's something here, splitting this is equivalent to a linear representation. 
And so that's trivializing the anomaly is lifting this projective system to a linear system. And what are, if we have such a trivialization, we may not, the anomaly is an obstruction, but if we have uh, such a trivialization, then different trivializations are related by tensoring by a map, a representation of bordism into the ordinary category of lines. And those are exactly the invertible theories. So again, tensoring a theory by an invertible uh, theory doesn't change the physical projective theory that we start with. So just a quick historical pause from this abstract picture, just to say that this picture of an extension, a central extension of the Bordism category and expressing an anomalous theory as a linear representation of some central extension, that's already in Siegel's original paper, his uh, paper about two-dimensional conformal field theories. You can see he talks about an extension of the Bordism category here and saying that uh, Conformal field theory in that context is a representation of that extension. In fact, he was looking at something more general, not extensions by something abelian, by lines, but more generally by something finite dimensional. All right. So that is the key picture from this talk, I must say. And let's now analyze a little bit more what this anomaly is. What is the nature of that anomaly? So what is this category here, suspension of lines? Well, the objects of that are what we might call gerbs. There are many models of what gerbs are. Um, we can flesh that out a little more in the discussion. But a gerb is what we encountered before. Given a projective space, you get a gerb. It's the object that obstructs the lifting to a, um, a, a linear space or rather it's the object whose trivializations correspond to liftings of that projective space to a linear space. And so what is an anomaly theory? Well, it's an n-dimensional theory. We still have the same Bordism category. We haven't changed that. So it's an n-dimensional theory. A theory out of n-dimensional Bordism is a field theory. The structure of Bordism is telling us about fields, about gluing and so on. The F is telling us the background fields. But it takes values in a shifted place from our usual theory. It doesn't assign vector spaces to n minus one manifolds. It assigns um, a gerb. So it's a once categorified, it's shifted. And that shifting is what we saw already at the beginning when we have a group extension and we look at its projectivity, the equivalence class is in H2, not H1. It's shifted up one from the invertibles. So this is an n-dimensional theory it's invertible, it's something abelian or invertible, but it's once categorified, it's shifted, which is exactly what we expect for expressing the projectivity. So what is an n-dimensional theory? Uh, what is this kind of theory with this given projectivization? Well, now we can't just say, by the way, this triangle commutes, we have to give data that tells us how it commutes, that's additional data of this theory with this specified anomaly. And that kind of theory is what we call a relative theory. So we have this once categorified invertible theory, and this projective theory is what we would call a relative theory relative to this uh, once categorified invertible theory. So the partition function that you would get on a closed manifold, instead of being a complex number, it's an element of the complex line, which is given by this anomaly theory. That's exactly what the data telling you about this commutativity gives you. So this kind of notion was introduced by different people, myself and Konstantin Telemann, for example, but earlier by Stoltz and Teichner, who call them twisted theories and call this uh, twisting. And to, an, to a space, an n minus one manifold, instead of assigning a linear space, we get a projective space, but with the prescribed projectivity of the anomaly. And again, if we are able to linearize the theory, trivialize the anomaly, then ratios of trivializations are maps like this, which is a standard um, n-dimensional invertible theory. So that's the, the kind of picture that uh, emerges. Now it's usually said in the modern way a little bit differently. And it's usually said that the anomaly is an n plus one dimensional theory, which is invertible and that the um, 
anomalous theory sits on the boundary as a boundary theory. And so again, we've seen that as an expression of projectivity, the anomaly is this n-dimensional theory, but shifted once categorified. But this n-dimensional boredism category might sit in an n plus one dimensional boredism category. We have to give n plus one dimensional fields, whereas here we have n-dimensional fields. And if we specify a suitable boredism category here, we could ask whether this once categorified theory extends to a theory like this. And that theory, well, there's something perhaps wrong with the shifting, but that theory would be then a, um, an ordinary invertible field theory. And in that case, in the relative theory would be promoted to what's called a boundary theory for alpha, which means it's a representation of some bigger n plus one dimensional boredism category where we're allowed to color the boundaries with some boundary theory. So the coloring is the abstract boredism way of telling that we have this boundary theory. So in many, many examples, we can find this extension and then we get this picture, which is the one that's usually said of an anomalous theory as living on the boundary of a one higher dimensional invertible theory. And if we can do that, that's very powerful because now we have an invertible field theory, a full invertible field theory. It's not cut off, so to speak, at the top down to n. And it assigns to an n plus one manifold that's closed. So now it has some topology to it, some number, which is its uh, partition function, some invertible number. And those are very useful in studying uh, these anomalies. So if we have this extension, it's of course something very useful. And I want to emphasize that there's nothing in this talk that I've said that's topo that restricts us to topological. I mean, in general, field theory obviously are not topological. The anomaly is in general not topological. Nothing in this story is necessarily topological. Now, it sometimes happens that we have a non-topological theory, but its anomaly is topological. That's a favorable situation. And when that happens, topological tools are available to study it. Okay. So I've gone through these three kinds of um, points about the projective nature. One, the uh, general story about projective spaces and projective symmetries. And then we've seen quantum mechanics and quantum field theory in that general context. So let me just say a word about invertible field theories. That's what the anomaly turns out to be in quantum field theory and just what kind of mathematical framework we have for uh, studying it. So I can't, of course, say much. But um, the framework is called differential cohomology. And it's a nice theory as part of, I think, of it as part of differential geometry, where we have a cohomology theory, which you can think of as being standard eilenberg maclean integer cohomology. But in applications to physics, it turns out that sometimes, for example, some flavor of K-theory is relevant or some truncation of K-theory and so on. And this differential cohomology is some kind of refinement of this topological theory. So as an illustration, if we take ordinary eilenberg maclean and we take it in degree one, then the cohomology of a manifold or even a topological space is what? Well, it's given by functions from the space, the manifold M into the circle but we only remember the homotopy class of the function. That's what the first cohomology with integer coefficients is. It's the homotopy classes of maps to the circle. This differential refinement here remembers the actual map to the circle and it should be a smooth map. So here we need M to be a smooth manifold and then we get a smooth map to the circle. That's the information. If we go to degree two, in degree two, the second cohomology are principal circle bundles up to isomorphism. So they're isomorphism classes of principal circle bundles. But the differential refinement is a differential, is a circle bundle together with a connection. So it's got some extra differential data. And again, here we're only remembering isomorphism classes if we're taking the cohomology group. Co-cycle, so to speak, would be the actual connection. That's the local object. So if we stick with these circle bundles with connection up to isomorphism, there's a map out to differential forms, which is the curvature, that's local information. And there's also a map out to forget the connection, 
And remember the underlying topology, that's this map, this forgetful map. And that's just the first turn class of the circle bundle. And the two agree, if we go over the reals, the differential form has a Durham cohomology class and the integer cohomology class, if we forget torsion, we, we tensor with the reals, we forget integrality and all that, then these two match, of course. But that's not all the information, as you could see by taking the manifold to be the circle, because the curvature is zero, the turn class is zero, but over the circle, we could have holonomy. And so the secret to this differential cohomology is really remembering the holonomy, which is the kind of homotopy between the agreement here. So here's a picture of what differential cohomology looks like. We have the curvature. In the image of the curvature, well, it's a differential form. So there's some big vector space of differential two forms that are closed. But inside the vector space, we're only getting the ones that have integral periods. Those are the curvatures. And those are a union of affine subspaces. So somewhere here are the exact forms. That's a linear space. And then it's affine translates, by um, which have integer periods. So if we look at the map to the Durham cohomology, we're hitting a lattice. That's the lattice of the image of integer cohomology. But the differential theory, which you should think of as an abelian Lie group, these are Lie groups, infinite dimensional, there's a kernel to the curvature, which is namely the flat bundles. And the flat bundles look like, well, a union of tori. It's really a group whose identity component is a torus. And um, the components here are telling us the ones with torsion churn classes, that's measuring the torsion. But where we are in the torus is telling us the holonomies as here on the circle. So this is just a taste to tell you that there's a beautiful mathematical theory of differential cohomology. Here I've discussed H2 for the eilenberg maclean but we can do it with K-theory and so on. There's a very beautiful general um, theory. So invertible field theories, as I say, fit into this um, framework. So uh, it's something that Greg uh, Moore and I introduced 20 years ago, I think, this idea of an invertible field theory. And uh, there's a connection to topology, to homotopy theory that gives you these tools, something uh, discussed in many, many ways since then with Mike uh, Hopkins and Constantine Telemann. And again, an invertible field theory is one of these theories, this differential co-cycle, but not on smooth manifolds, but on, again, boredism, on the boredism category. And the particular theory that one wants to use, there's a universal choice. And again, this kind of idea was fleshed out in a very influential paper of, of Mike Hopkins and his singer, who was mentioned earlier a few times. Um, so here's the diagram. So I gave you this diagram here when we think about circle bundles, that we have curvature and we have turn class. And with invertible field theories, we have an analogous diagram where we have, I've put the dimensions, so this is the anomaly theory of an n plus of an n dimensional theory. We have its curvature, which gives us a n plus two form, but that form is on boredism. It's some sort of universal expression on families of n manifolds together with background fields like connections and so on. And this is exactly the local anomaly. On the other hand, it has a deformation class. That deformation class gets rid of the differential information like the curvature and just remembers the topology. But that deformation class is um, preserved when you, uh, for example, go to renormalization group flow. So that deformation class is what one can use as a tool to say something about the low energy theory in terms of the high energy theory, because the deformation class of the anomaly hasn't changed under that renormalization group flow. And as I say, that's uh, accessible by a homotopical methods. That's something topological, same way the churn class of a circle bundle is topological. Okay. So that's uh, the, the end of the discussion about the projective nature of quantum theory and what an anomaly is and how it fits into that. So let me say how it's an obstruction when we want to quantize. What does that mean? So again, this goes back to the slogan. This is what we've covered. And now we're going to say quantization is linear. So what do I mean by that? 
well, what is quantization? So we start with a theory that has some collection of fields. Maybe it has a metric and maybe it has a spinner field. Maybe it has a connection. Maybe it has those three. And now say we want to integrate out the spinner field. So we want to be left with just the metric and the connection. So here we would have metric connection spinner field. Here we would have metric connection. And this forms a fiber bundle where the fibers are the spinner fields. And we want to integrate. We want to kind of push forward along this fiber bundle. That's the quantization process. So formally, we want to integrate out some of these background fields. We want to turn them into fluctuating fields and get a new theory on fewer background fields. So the quantization is the passage from a theory here to a theory here. Well, theories are this complicated object. And of course, all the analysis of quantum field theory is there. I'm not saying anything about that. But the theme is that the projectivity is a piece that you can get your hands on with the kinds of tools I've indicated, which is this invertible abelian piece. And why do we need to get our hands on that? Well, the partition function of this theory up here, because it's projective with some uh, anomaly alpha, the partition function is a section of some complex line bundle. It's not a uh, complex valued function. And I want to sum it over the fibers. So I want to sum the values of some function in some complex line bundle. Well, we can't sum vectors in different vector spaces. We just can't do that. So what we have to do is trivialize that vector bundle. In the same way, if we're on a space, we want to carry out some quantization we get a bundle of projective spaces. That's what our quantum theory is up here. And we wanna say that the space down here is some sort of space of sections of those, but that doesn't work with projective spaces. We need to get vector spaces. We need to linearize to do that quantization. So we need to trivialize the anomaly, but we only need to trivialize it along the fibers, so to speak. And so what that's called is giving descent data. In other words, we have to take this anomaly and we have to descend it to the base, the base being this uh, fields like metric and connection without the spinner field. So we have to exactly give descent data. And that's what we need to quantize. That's the kind of formal thing we need, but that's the piece that we can get at without the, the projective nature, without thinking about the whole field theory. And that of course, tells us only so much, but sometimes it's quite useful to think about anomalies, as we know from many, many examples, going back to those papers in the 80s, string theory and so on. So if it can descend, that's an obstruction problem. So there's an existence and uniqueness. The existence is whether it descends at all, and the uniqueness is specifying the descent and understanding what the different descents are. And so the different descents are a torsor over n-dimensional, I should have said, invertible theories. And so we could descend in different ways by tensoring with an invertible theory. And so that's where the anomaly is uh, an obstruction. Okay, so the summary before I give one example of the spinner fields is that quantum theory is projective. The Edhoft anomaly or the anomaly itself is expression of the projectivity. But quantization is linear, and in that context, the anomaly is an obstruction. If the obstruction vanishes, you have to specify this descent data, which is, as I said, a torsor over invertible field theories. The same theme we've seen several times. When we split this extension, we get a torsor over characters. It's the same principle. And again, there's a well-developed theory of invertible field theories based on differential cohomology, and so we can access that using geometric and topological tools. And again, crucially, the anomaly is not just something you calculate as part of a theory that's some quantity, but rather it itself is a field theory. It itself is an invertible version of field theory. So it fits into the um, context of field theory as having properties of locality, unitarity, and so on. All right, so I think I have five minutes left to, to just briefly show you, to come back to, again, the 80s, the topic that recurs all the time, which is the anomaly of a spinner field, and just say quickly how that looks. 
So what is a spinner field? Well, we'll start in Minkowski space-time. So we're starting in the relativistic setting. And Minkowski space-time is an affine space over a vector space that's equipped with a Lorentz metric of that signature. And uh, one more piece of data, which is a time orientation. We have a, for, a choice of forward light cone. So that gives us um, these cones and the notion of forward time. And of course, duly a notion of positive energy, and that's important for the wick rotation. And then we have the Lorentz group, which is the group of linear symmetries here, the spin group, the double cover of the identity component of the isometries, and it sits in the Clifford algebra. So what is the data of a spinner field? Well, it's a, a real representation of this group called S. And saying that it's a spin representation means that it's a module over this Clifford algebra. And this is the even Clifford algebra. So this is ungraded. There's no Z2 grading. And we need one more piece of data. And it's actually, I still find this an astounding fact that it's a characterization of Lorentz signature among all possible signatures that inside the symmetric square, this is symmetric, of uh, the spin representation, you find a copy of the vector representation. That's a rather astounding fact that distinguishes Lorentz signature. So there's always a symmetric pairing back to the vectors, and it has a positivity property. In fact, there's a positive pairing that on the diagonal, you get into the closure of this forward time-like vectors. So you get forward vectors. And then you also specify a mass. The mass may be zero. There may not be any non-zero masses, but the mass is a skew-symmetric real-valued pairing. Okay, so uh, in the irreducible case, as I said, that this gamma always exists and it's actually unique up to scale. And once we've chosen this data, we can extend and look at S plus its dual and take not just the even Clifford algebra, but take the whole Z2 graded Clifford algebra and make this into a module over the whole Clifford algebra. And so that's very useful. And any finite dimensional module has this form. So they all come from that way. So we could study spinner fields by studying these Z2 graded modules over this Clifford algebra. And here's a lemma that um, Mike Hopkins and I proved buried in one of our papers, but uh, I'm kind of curious if someone knows that the, I, I don't know, I, I doubt it's original, but I wonder. But anyway, um, the question is, are there non-degenerate mass pairings? And those correspond exactly to extending this Clifford module to a one higher um, Clifford algebra, where we have one extra generator here. So these are the generators that square to plus one. These are the ones that square to minus one. We have one more generator in that. So that extension is a Clifford module is exactly what a mass term gives you. So that's a very useful lemma. And so the problem then is how do we express the anomaly of a spinner field? So there's some invertible theory in this case, it really does extend to a full m plus one dimensional invertible theory. So I'm asking the question in that form, given this data, this very general spinner data. So um, it's going to be an invertible field theory where the background fields are a Riemannian metric and a spin structure. That's what we need to specify the free spinner field. Well, there's a curvature to the theory. That's the local anomaly. And that's the differential form, the anomaly polynomial, if you like, that appears, of course, in the literature about local anomalies. It's built from the um, A hat genus from those uh, theories. Okay, so that may or may not vanish. In some dimensions, it definitely vanishes just due to dimension reasons, in which case the anomaly is topological. So as I said, we can have physical theories that aren't topological, like a free spinner field, but the anomaly might be topological. We could also put the space of mass pairings. I won't say what that is here, what the anomaly works out to be, but we could take that as an additional background field. So in fact, you could study the mass as a function rather than a parameter. And uh, in a joint paper with uh, Clay Cordova, Hotot Lam, and Nadi Seiberg, um, we said something about what the anomaly is, uh, including the mass. 
But without the mass, uh, again, in this paper with uh, Mike Hopkins, we said what it is. So here's the data. This is my last slide. And here's um, this lemma about extending uh, a non-degenerate mass term allows you to extend. Well, that resonates with the fact that if you have a, a possible mass term, then the anomaly is supposed to be trivializable. So it's isomorphism class vanishes. That's the standard statement. And so the anomaly can only depend on the, this Clifford module, the spinner representation up to those which extend to this higher Clifford algebra. And that's exactly what Atiyah, Bott, and Shapiro way back in the early 60s taught us, although I wasn't old enough to absorb the lesson at that time, that um, that means that the isomorphism class, of, uh, the equivalence class of those, modulo the extensions, exactly are related to KO theory. So they live in some KO group of a point, if you like. And then it's in terms of that that we can express the anomaly. And so the anomaly, at least the isomorphism class of the anomaly for the uh, spinner field has some expression like this. So again, I'm not going to try to explain, I'm just flashing it for you just to show you how this point of view and these techniques can let you say something uh, you know, in, in one situation, there are many more situations, but this M spin is boredism. It goes back to Rene Tom, and we get a function from boredism to some cohomology. So this is the cohomology class on boredism, and we're supposed to take a differential lift. That's the invertible field theory, and it's expressed in terms of, um, oh, it's missing something, but it's expressed in terms of this map from boredism to KO, which is, again, part of the Tia uh, Bot Shapiro, and uh, in terms of this Poffian which is a certain map on KO theory that um, is related to its kind of self-duality. So this is a very much a topological expression of the duality of the anomaly, but the Atiyah Singer theory in a geometric form tells you that there should be an analytic expression as well. And so, for example, the partition function is in terms of the Atiyah Patodi Singer eight invariance and so on. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Dan, for a very interesting talk. And uh, I think I'm going to stop your sheen sh screen sharing for the moment. And uh, That's fine. so we can all see each other. And let me put pictures up together. So I'd like to open the discussion. And if you do want to comment or ask a question, please turn on your video so we can actually talk to each other. So there were so many things here that uh, we uh, indicated that I wanted to think also about not only the 1980s, but go back to the 1970s. So let me start by asking a question. If you look at the Euclidean field theory, and not the topological, but just the flat case and consider spinner fields of the form of Osterwald and Schroeder, then if you have reflection positivity, you can go to quantum theory. Can you see the anomaly in the Euclidean case? Um, well, I don't know if I can know enough quite to answer about that context to answer that question right off. I mean, I think the general answer I would give is yes, because the anomaly being this invertible field theory is something local. And so even on Euclidean space, it's something you could detect. So for example, if there's a local anomaly, if the curvature, as I called it, is not zero, then surely that's something you should be able to see on Euclidean space. In what concrete so, form it would take in that context is not something I can quite answer on the spot, I think. Right. Well, we could try to work out your example in that case. Yeah, I so, mean, the uh, first case would be a spinner field in two dimensions, right? That's the first one that has a local anomaly <clears throat> given by the A hat, the, the you know, 124th or 48th, depending on how you do it, of the <clears throat> Pontryagin class. So. Could you see that? I don't, you'd have a hard time seeing that with a single 
system. You'd have to look at a family of systems to really see that. To, to see the local form, you would somehow have to work with something that gave you a family of systems or some symmetry. As I said, having symmetry is an example of having a family. So you could have one system with some symmetry and then I think you would see it or a family of systems, but just one spinner field, that's gonna be very hard to measure that concretely. So, uh, yeah. well, I, I was just wondering if there's an obstruction to finding reflection positivity or something like that. Ah. Well, I hadn't thought of that. I mean, <clears throat> I suppose if you had a quantum theory where you had the anomaly, the anomaly is an invertible field theory, but not a unitary one. We could ask whether the anomaly theory has a, is unitarizable somehow. And I suppose if the answer to that is no, then probably the whole theory wouldn't be unitarizable. I hadn't thought of the anomaly as an obstruction to or reflection positive. I mean, the, the Wick rotated version. I hadn't thought of that, but that, that's, that's a nice point. So are there other comments or questions? I have a question concerning the um, uh, the characterization, the possible characterization of um, of projective space. Uh, namely, um, I, I wonder if um, it could be a step in that direction. If, if I wonder if von Neumann's uh, uh, characterization of a of a lattice of subspaces uh, it could be a step in that direction. And then you just take the uh, one dimensional subspaces. Well, yeah, I mean, certainly if we're given a vector space, so we have to have an ambient vector space in which to take one dimensional subspaces, if I'm understanding. Well, no, no, they took the lat he had a paper, a very long paper characterizing the lattice of, uh, of subspace, the abstract lattice of subspace. Ah. ah, okay. Then that, that sounds right. I, I don't know that paper. I'm not connecting with it at the it, moment. It was edited after his death by. Um, Israel Halpern. Actually, von Neumann set out to characterize the um, lattice of subspaces of a type 2 1 von Neumann factor. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, after 250 pages of TypeScript, he ended up with the type 1 factor, finite type 1 factor, and then put, put some comments. Maybe the axioms can be weakened. Well, when Israel Halpern retired, that's what he did. And he published it under von Neumann's name, of course. And uh, it, um, Oh, okay. It's well, thank very, you. I'll, I'll look for that. That sounds very interesting. Yeah, I mean, just in this comment, I suppose, about this general Klein, you know, Erlangen program picture. I mean, as I said, you might think of a geometry specifying a type of geometry as specifying some smooth manifold together with a Lie group action. So I don't think anyone would prefer that. Uh, definition for a vector space to the one that we teach undergraduates. It's a set with this functions and so on. That's a more concrete version of what a vector space is rather than a right torsor for that symmetry group. So when we have that kind of thing available for geometries, of course, we want that. And so I didn't know that there might be this one for projective space, at least when I thought about it. I mean, again, I, I gave you four types of projective spaces, depending on what kind of symmetry you have, what kind of structure you have. And that would presumably be one of those types. And there are, of course, other ones. We could take other symmetry groups acting on the same CPM. Thank you. So I'll, I'll look into that. Thanks. Thank you, George. Are there other comments? I have another question about the, the uh, Fafian, um, this Fafian map. Um, uh, something that um, really, really um, uh, uh, was, a, was a, a theme over a number of years in my, in my work was, um, uh, well, I, I calculated the, um, the, the churn character, the, the, tra the trace on projections, I put it that way, just the trace on projections for a, um, a higher dimensional non-commutative uh, torus like the two-dimensional case is sometimes called the rotation algebra. Well, um, 
and and these are certain um, <coughs> polynomials in the in the rotation numbers. So you have a whole lot of pairs of unitaries, and each one has a rotation number. Uh, and and uh, okay, so you, what you get is a certain you go the, the tra possible traces of projections in this algebra are the um, are the are polynomials in the um, rotation numbers, and and they're what are called uh, they turn out to be what are called Fafian polynomials. Well, I, 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 my late colleague in Copenhagen, Niels Vegan Peterson, had a paper on uh, Lie, gr Lie groups. Uh, well, the higher dimensional non commutatorial are related to discrete groups, so, uh, two step nilpotent groups. But uh, uh, Niels Vegan Peterson had a, had, had a very uh, long paper. I couldn't understand any of it, uh, but be beautiful, but like, uh, um, where he got the same polynomials in connection with Lie groups. But I couldn't figure out how. Okay. But then uh, somewhat later, uh, Detlef Pogunke. Uh, published a paper where he gave a complete explanation of this uh, 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 popping up in two places of the Vapian polynomials. Namely, you look at a connected uh, uh, locally compact group. He only proved it for Lie groups, but I, I, I don't see why it needs to be a Lie group. Then um, you look at the Seastra algebra of the group, of the connected group, and, and you look at, an, at a primitive quotient of it, you look at its image in an irreducible uh, representation, then uh, if it's not the compact operators, then it, and, and it, well, it might contain an ideal isomorphic to the compact operators if the group is type one, but well, as it, which as it would if the group is type one, but it always contains a simple two-sided ideal, which is the tensor product of, comp of an algebra of compact operators and a higher dimensional non commutative torus. So that explains why the um, uh, uh, pol Fafian uh, polynomials occur uh, maybe in Peter in, in Vegan Peterson's work. We neither of us were aware of Puguntka's um, discovery. Well, okay, yeah. Okay. And then so I just, so whenever I see the name uh, Faf, I think of that. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, I'm sure, obviously it's the same FAF and it may not be, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it's a related, if it's a related phenomenon. No, the FAFian as a square root of determinant is hidden in there, but it's, um, you know, in this K theory, KO theory context, so it's it's a little bit hidden. Okay, well, there is certainly yes. It's suspicious. It's suspicious that it's K theory because that's what the trace of projections is. Ah, I see. Okay. Um, if I might ask, I, I may. I was intrigued by your uh, comment about the mass term being an extension uh, in this particular way. Can you say a little bit more on that? Um. Sure. Um, well, uh, maybe, uh, <laughs> I don't remember. It went by a little fast for me, so. <laughs> no, well, of course, I understand. I was trying to give a conceptual overview of a picture rather than the detail to follow. Um, no, and that lemma takes a little bit of, of proving to see why, um, why when you have that, ex uh, you know, one direction, why a mass term, how you get this extra generator. I think if you have the extra generator, you can see uh, the mass term. But you know, if you have a module over an algebra, then every element of the algebra is acting on the um, module. And the module is, let's remember, it's S plus S star, where S is the spin representation. And the Clifford generators are units, they're invertible because they square to plus or minus one, and they're also odd. So they exchange the Z2 grading. So in other words, a Clifford generator maps S to S star, a linear map from S to S star. Well, a map from S to S star is equivalent to a bilinear form on S. It's a map from S tensor S to the scalars. So the Clifford generators give you a bilinear form. Now you have to see why that particular Clifford generator, and because it squares to minus one rather than plus one, it gives you a skew symmetric form. But that Clifford generator commutes with the Clifford algebra generated by all the other generators. So that's where the spin representation is. 
And so this is commuting. So therefore it's a map of spin representations. So it's a skeuomorphic form on the spin representation. So that kind of argument shows you why an extra Clifford generator squaring to minus one gives you a mass form, gives you the skeuomorphic form. And that's the basic relation. It takes more to prove the other direction that, yeah. And you could see it's a non-degenerate form because the Clifford generator squares to, you know, is invertible. So, so that's why you get a non-degenerate mass form. You don't get zero or something. So that's the basic relation, which as I say, I would love to know a reference. I, I don't know if that's um, new, but it's something we observed, which, you know, is something that, also resonates with uh, some work, I think, of Katayev and so on in uh, condensed matter physics. And, and in fact, here, I, I said the simplest case of the spin group, but in condensed matter physics in particular, although this idea goes back to the early 60s, again, with uh, Dyson, he has a very famous paper, which is usually remembered as being about a threefold way about random matrices and so on, and three different types of random matrices. But in fact, his paper is about a tenfold way. And that tenfold way was rediscovered in different forms um, by condensed matter physicists like Zermbauer, Altland, and so on. And in the same paper with Mike Hopkins, we uh, gave a tenfold way in relativistic field theory in the form of 10 different symmetry groups that kind of reflect that same 10. And the spin group is the most basic case, but there are variations for the pin group, for spin C, for other kinds of groups. And the story I gave you with um, you know, free fermion uh, theories, free spinner fields all have analogs in each of these cases. You, you can treat all 10 cases uniformly by treating the 10 different kinds of real and complex uh, Clifford algebras. So in fact, you know, the, the anomaly for all those kinds of um, Spinner fields is given by a similar, similar expression. I just gave you uh, one of them. But anyway, the masts again would have an analog. I think in all of those cases, uh, as being this, it would as being this extra Clifford generator. Okay, thank you. That's that's very helpful. The same formula, by the way. It's curious that you could ask, well, supposing we have a mass. Now we have, say, a non-degenerate mass. So now we have a massive spinner field, this free theory. And that theory, you could ask, what is its low energy approximation, right? It's no longer anomalous, by the way, because of the mass. So, okay, so what is that? And it turns out that the same kind of formula, the same kind of homotopical formula. Well, the, fir the first point I should have made is if you quantize the free fermion on any space, then you get a, you know, the completion of a fermionic Fox space. And that Fox space has a unique vacuum. And so having a unique vacuum on each space is a signal of invertibility, meaning that the low energy theory, if we remember the vacuum theory, what you might call the far infrared, that theory should be invertible, that uniqueness of the vacuum. And so we could ask the question, what is that invertible theory attached to a massive spinner field? So it's not the anomaly, the projectivity question, but in the massive case, you're asking for the low energy theory. And it turns out that that is given, I mean, this is all not theorems because you have to set up more of a framework to make theorems, but anyway, but that theory, that invertible theory is given by a very similar formula, but where you look at, now you have these two negative generators in the Clifford algebra, and you look at it modulo those that extend to three generators, and you make a similar kind of um, story and you get, uh, theory, invertible theory of the right dimension, and that's the theory that is the low energy theory of a massive spinner field. So, you know, I, I don't know completely, I think, why obstructing that third, yeah, why if you had the third Clifford generator, I don't think I know a heuristic argument why we would expect the invertible theory to be trivial. Maybe I didn't think hard enough about that, but it, it again only depends on the kind of uh, you know, that class in the modules, modulo, the ones that extend, which is what the K theory comes, comes to. And um, anyway, so that's a kind of curious thing, which again, is something that resonates with the, um, with the uh, condensed matter literature, which was really more the point of the paper with Hopkins, or at least the inspiration, I should say, for, for that paper. Well, <laughs> thank you again, Dan, for a really interesting and stimulating talk. And we'll look to the future developments because you 
have talked about a lot of unsolved problems, which are really good for the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, you again, Arthur, for having me. Good to see you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.